where they would, you know, announce a business's phone number on the radio and just they would get the business would get flooded with so many calls that, you know, they, they it kind of proved the point at how effective this radio station advertising could be. And so, you know, they went about it that way. And I know a lot of the DJs brought their own record collections out to the fort to play. And, you know, each kind of person had their own specialty, the type of music they would play or the kind of tone of the program. So, you know, as time went by, they certainly, it it got more streamlined. It got more developed a much more workable schedule and process and things like that. Once they decamp to Sealands, when I think you mentioned the BBC starts playing the music that Formerly, they didn't, so the Radio Essex loses its reason for being. Once they decamp there, how do things change when Roy figures, okay, you know, I, I've started my own independent streak. Why not set up my own nation? I think that, um, you know, as I mentioned, it was partly an, an act of stubbornness where um, he'd gone, you know, he'd been fined. He had to go, you know, appear before a judge and just all these really heavy duty efforts to um, discourage he and his family and all of his cohorts from going out there. And so once they decamped to Sealand, it was kind of up in the air what they were going to do with it. I mean, I think that he realized that there was certainly some kind of opportunity in this offshore fort that was, again, in genuinely international waters. And so the first step toward whatever would come next was to officially declare it to be the Bates territory. And so on September 2nd, 1967, that's Independence Day, which happened to be Joan's 38th birthday. And Roy, you know, always made a note that he gifted his wife (laughs) her own private island. (laughs) And so from there, having this sort of official status was crucial to what whatever it was they wanted to do next. They wanted to really underscore that it was his dominion and going forward that they were going to do with it what they would like. And so, uh, again, setting up their own state was just uh, part of that process. I mean, how do you start your own nation? Does he first begin and write a constitution? Does he declare to the nations that we are sovereign and hope that he gets a telegram back from Monaco or Luxembourg saying, ah, oh, welcome to the world stage, right. my friend. We wish the prosperity of Sealand. And how does that work when you start your own nation? You know, he first looked into all this by consulting with his lawyer and, you know, on paper, based on where uh, this fort was located, it did seem that they had some arguable claim to do with it what they would like. And so that was kind of the first step, just establishing, you know, that there was some precedent to do this. And that kind of gets into how states are created and who recognizes them and things like that, which is its own complicated topic. You know, they didn't really necessarily start bombarding embassies with requests for recognition, but they did write a constitution, issue their own stamps and coins and various other trappings of statehood that would lend credence to their claims. It wasn't until the early 1970s when they met this somewhat sketchy group of German and Dutchmen that they, they the, these Germans and Dutchmen really took the lead in truly bombarding the UN and uh, the embassies and governments of practically every country in the world at that time for recognition uh, to I guess, mixed results, let's say. <laughs> yeah, what kind of response did they get from different nations? It's pretty funny, actually, because in the in the UK National Archives, which has a, a couple of boxes of documents related to the, this whole Sealand saga, I mean, they're just some really funny letters <laughs> from representatives of other governments who were just like totally befuddled at this request. And then you see the British government's responses get gradually more, you know, you can almost hear the people writing just like, shaking their head in dismay or, you know, (laughs) kind of slapping their forehead like, oh, this again. (laughs) And so essentially the response was just, just, just ignore it. Like we can't control what they do, but this is by no means like we do not consider this to be a real country. And so, you know, of course that stance, the British government, you know, perhaps only strengthened their resolve, but at least from the British government's part, you know, they did not extend even any kind of recognition at all. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Were there any really positive cases where, I don't know, some random nation like in Uruguay or a Micronesia really does take them seriously or at least puts out the olive branch? 
there were a couple of countries that maybe accidentally <laughs> extended recognition, or at least there was some sort of confusion that kind of seemed perhaps more official than it, than it really was. There were, over time, a few fellow micronations, which is to say, you know, invented countries on disputed territories. Some of them, some micronations do have similarly, you know, plausible arguments, at least, for their own sovereignty. So there have been a few cases of recognition from, uh, you know, territories of similar status over the years. Yeah, I mean, this makes me think this this is in the 1960s when it's the final last gasping breath of colonies, British and French colonies, where all these nations in Africa are gaining their own independence, nations in the Middle East. So you do have brand new nations coming out. Now, it's very different for something like Uganda, which had borders that had been recognized by colonial administrators for decades, declare its independence, and it's immediately received into the international community versus something that's much smaller, which uh, at this time, Sealand, who occupies this uh, beyond Roy's family? And there are these other freebooters, I guess you could say, Dutch and Germans that come along. Who else is there at this time? And I'll just say here, uh, if, you know, if anybody hasn't seen what Sealand actually looks like, again, it's two huge concrete towers with seven layers of floors in them, some of which are below the surface of the water. Uh, and these towers stick, you know, about 50 feet off of the surface of the water. And there's a metal superstructure where the, you know, radar room and mess hall and various other things would have been. So it's essentially like... And it's the size of about two tennis courts, this platform on top. So it's essentially like a, I guess, you know, a garage, a garage <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. So, you know, it can be a very difficult place to reside. All that to say, it's mostly the Bates family who is occupying it. I mean, they have some, you know, very dedicated friends and, and supporters who spend some time out there as well. But it's by and large Michael Bates, who is Roy Bates's son who is out there as the title of his autobiography is holding the fort. So, you know, he, he estimates he's spent <laughs> a cumulative 20 years of his life out there. And I, I would say the bulk of that was in the sixties and seventies when they were getting things up and running and still were facing serious attempts at takeover by various other groups interested in this uh, structure. Yeah. I think at some point there was an attempted coup where you say the Prince Regent was taken hostage. Was that Roy's son that was taken hostage? Yeah, so that is Michael Bates, who is still Prince Regent today. At the time, he was in his mid-20s, so he's uh, in his mid to late 60s now. Long story short, these Germans basically turned on them, and when Michael was out on the fort alone one day, they helicoptered him, helicoptered in, locked him in a storeroom, tied him up, uh, dumped him on a boat, and uh, took him to Holland, where they kicked him off without a passport or any money. And so he was able to find his way back to England, thanks to a sympathetic skipper. He met back up with his parents, who were initially quite upset with him for getting captured in the first place. But then they, in turn, helicopter, you know, went out there with their own men, rappelled down some ropes, beat up the invaders, and retook the fort. And uh, that's certainly one of the most pivotal events in Sealand's history, because once they retook the fort and held some of these would-be German invaders hostage, that whole back and forth um, necessitated a visit from a German diplomat, which obviously was seized upon as an official visit from a government official from a, a very recognized state. What were those negotiations like when this diplomat comes? Is is he just looking at this in total confusion of it's like I'm a RA of a dorm floor and I'm sorting out a fight between a few like college students or <laughs> does, does he look on it differently? Um, well, it's kind of interesting too, because again, looking at the correspondence between the British government and the various, you know, Dutch and German governments who were like, wait a second, you got some of our people held hostage on this weird platform off off your coast and the British government was like, well, it's in international waters, so it's really not our problem. But I think ultimately one of the guys who was being held captive, uh, his wife was petitioning the German government to do something about it. And so they ultimately dispatched, I don't remember ex his exact title, but you know, some sort of attache for the German embassy in the UK, they helicoptered out of him out there and um, 
the Sealanders had a lot of fun, you know, making sure this guy had all his visa in order, frisking him, just really putting him through the ringer, <laughs> uh, since they were still a little sore that, um, you know, these would be investors had essentially sold them out and tried to take over the fort, not to mention they held Michael hostage and, you know, tied him legitimately tied him up and left him in a closet for a while. You describe them as investors, and I'm curious about the economy of Sealand. When it comes to basic provisions, is the Bates family just buying things from lobstermen and other fishermen as they go by, and then they're bringing in supplies from mainland Britain, or are they still operating some kind of communications? Are they doing something else with their economy to try to build up their own wealth? And are they just living off of Roy's personal fortune, or are they able to accrue money elsewhere? Well, the plan, even if there was no concrete plan in mind, I suppose, the goal was always to turn this into some sort of money-making endeavor. And so that's where these Germans came in. They you know, were interested in expanding its footprint, setting up a hotel, you know, an oil rig, even a coffee shop, you know, fairly implausible plans. But I think they ultimately really wanted to use it as uh, a tax haven. But until something like that could actually get going, it was purely up to the Bates family to keep it supplied with diesel, you know, all the uh, amenities to make it a comfortable place to live, all the food and things like that. And so it was really quite an intense investment up until fairly recently when it finally started making a profit because, you know, it was again, just them having to pay for the fuel to get out there and everything that goes with keeping the place occupied and fed with water, with adequate water and supplies for essentially an indefinite amount of time. And Michael told me, you know, at one point that he had his house repossessed because they couldn't pay for both. I mean, Michael, you know, he said when he was younger, he remembers them having to sell pieces of furniture or records from the pirate radio collection to help pay for some of the expenses. So it was a really, you know, one writer described the whole venture as a quixotic financial sinkhole. <laughs> and for a long time, that basically was what, the, you know, that that was the situation out there. You know, they would make money here and there, but it was definitely, you know, a labor of love, again, until fairly recently when Thanks to the internet, it's brought more attention to them. And, you know, in addition to the sealing merchandise they sell, the, the primary economy is based on buying Lord, Lady, Baron, Baroness, uh, things like that, titles from Sealand. Yeah, I was curious about that. What happens to Sealand in the next few decades? Does the family continue to occupy it? Is it abandoned sometimes? And that's how it makes money now by handing out titles with a tied to a sovereign nation state. Or are there other things that they do to be financially solvent? Every decade of Sealand's existence has, has had some kind of wild scheme, either as a product, you know, something that the Bates family hatched up or various other somewhat sketchy investors sort of taking advantage of the situation. And so, like in the late 90s, early 2000s, for example, the Sealand, some people wanted to use Sealand as an offshore data haven, this, you know, similar to a tax haven except for web hosting because the internet law wasn't really defined at the time. And so the thought was, well, we're in international waters. We can run gambling sites or, you know, other stuff with few exceptions that some governments would look down upon. And so there, that was probably the most promising prospect for what to do with Sealand. And, and that's a really fascinating story in its own right, because again, this was before internet law was really defined and codified. So it was a kind of a groundbreaking idea that, you know, they were able to raise Sealand and their various investors able to raise a couple million dollars to, to pursue this. But yeah, today, so today, this internet thing, Haven Co. eventually kind of fell apart. And so today, Sealand basically exists thanks to its own renown. And Michael's sons, who were in their early 30s, have been really good with establishing a Sealand presence on social media. And really, there's been a resurgence in popularity thanks to the internet and, again, the sale of these titles and various other pieces of merchandise and Michael's autobiography and things like that. And so finally, Sealand has become solvent and they're able to, you know, they're not in danger of <laughs> having to sell their house or their car or something like that to keep it going, fortunately. Do any of Michael's children occupy it 
is there permanent presence or only intermittent presence on Sealand? Sealand is occupied 24-7, 365. They have at least two caretakers, uh, one of which will stay out there for two weeks at a time and they'll switch each other out. And so I mentioned earlier about taking a 